We are back. It's another it's another episode of the Better Learning Podcast, and we're always trying to get different perspectives on here. And, and we we always talk about the three uh, groupings of our of our listenership. So um, I was uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna first bring in Alex Demchek here. Um, and I already pronounced it wrong. It's no, you said it. You said it right. Did man. I say it right? Yeah. Hey, as long as you say it with confidence, then it sounds great. <laughs> I could have confidence when I start, but then like afterwards, I'm like, oh, I totally screwed no, up. No, no, I think it was great, man. I think, um, you know, I've heard some other versions of Demcheck that were not anywhere near that. So I give you a nine and a half out of ten. All right, sounds good. I mean, I get a lot of like strollers with the last name or like Stollers, <laughs> and then, you know, and, and with my last name, Stoller, I'm like, I just let it roll. Like, wh- whatever it is, we just go with it. Hey, I've been called many uh, worse things. So um, I'll take it, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, we we always want to have these conversations like this, and that's why we brought on Alex here because we're we're trying to hit these three different buckets that we're, that we're always talking about. It's like the school leaders that are that are trying to figure it all out, and you know they like start in education, they put it into a leadership role, and you know and they're trying to figure figure out how they can be. That's because now they're like serving like so many different people from the communities and their boards and all the teachers and staff. And then we also have. A segment that that's supporting just like education in general, and then there's also just like the change makers, the the people that are that care about changing education. I think we're probably going to hit all three of those buckets, but I but I think this is going to be definitely more leadership focused. Um, but would you mind, Alex? Because I, I I know um, you know like your your background, um, football player, quarterback at Mizzou, uh, turning into an author. I I, I want to hear from your perspective. What what was school? What was like that? that K through 12 experience like for you? Man, it was a great experience. And so I grew up in public school and I loved, I mean, I loved all kinds of sports. And I would say, uh, looking back, I probably should have worked a little bit harder in school, uh, you know, cause football was at times my school, I think, but man, I, uh, yeah, I actually spoke at a school yesterday to a group of educators. So thank you for having me, man, because I love, um, literally I shared with this group yesterday, it was a quote from a guy named Billy Graham and he said, a teacher or a coach will impact more people in one year than the average person will in a lifetime without a doubt and yeah and it's like if that is if that is even close to being true which i think it is um that is a huge like responsibility it's a huge platform that educators have and so yeah man that's that's why i'm here on this on this show with you because my life has been been transformed in good ways and also in bad ways by different educators and excited to uh to share those different stories yeah well, well let, let's start uh let's start with the good like who are the those ones that stand out when you think about uh yeah i mean your your years going through school what was was there a certain one that you're like man that that that's the one that i can point to had the biggest impact yeah gosh that's uh there's a guy actually named ben tyland and uh, he was my eighth grade math teacher and it was really really sad unfortunately a year and a half ago he actually passed away unexpectedly he got cancer and within a few weeks uh, he was gone and um I look back at the, I mean, first off, uh, amazing guy, amazing family. I hated math. I still, I'm not good at math. <laughs> you know, I have to be self-employed. I have to worry about doing taxes and all that. That's about as much as math as I can handle. But man, this guy, um, he cared about people and kids and he didn't, didn't just, he didn't just rush through his stuff. To, it's like he cared. He just saw you and for who you were. And, and so that's an example of someone who did it the right way. And uh, he left us way too early too early and um another another teacher i had named aaron sovereign he was my fourth grade teacher he's in illinois as a teacher and he still is a he's now a superintendent and uh and um i remember vividly at recess i was obsessed with football and instead of just talking to all the teachers like a lot of them did he was actually out there playing football with us he was the quarterback i remember catching a touchdown and it's like those were memories i've never forgotten about and the cool full circle thing is about a year and a half ago he's at this school now in Illinois and he actually brought me in to speak to his students and his staff. And I was like, Oh my goodness, how full circle is that? That's really cool. Like a teacher who made a positive impact on my life. Now, years later, as I'm going around and speaking, he said, Hey, I want you to come speak to my staff, my students. And I was like, I was almost emotional because I was like, this is exactly the picture of what it can look like when you lead in a way, um, um, that, you can, you, your goal is to make an impact and a difference in kids' lives. And that's what you did in my life. And so that's why I was happy to make the trip to speak to his school. Cause I'm like, this is what it's about, man. So that, that, those are some good examples right off the bat that I can think of, of, of just people who really do it the right way, do it the right way. And, 
um, have allowed me to be who I am today because of those educators who took the time and, and, and they went out of their way. They did things that were not part of their job description to invest in people like me. And so, so grateful, man. And that's, that's why I'm on your podcast because yeah. it's, you're, you're helping people grow in the same way, man. It's awesome. Well, well, sometimes you learn from the, from the bad examples too. You, you, you alluded to, to some of that, uh, are, are there ones that stand out that, that, you know, like you saw it and you're like, Oh, that, that was the example that I want to avoid or, you know, it, it taught me a lesson, uh, you know, even, even though it was painful at the time. Yeah. Very painful at the time. But I think you bring up a great point in that, um, they're not always good. They're, and, um, when I was in seventh grade, I was obsessed with baseball. So before my obsession with football, it was baseball. I remember watching the movie, the rookie, like every day. If you remember that movie? <laughs> yeah. That was, was a great literally, one. Yeah, it was about a, like a high school teacher who starts pitching and he ends up going to the majors, you know, great movie. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I am going to be that guy someday. And uh, so I, I loved baseball. And I had a coach in seventh grade. He, he was a very successful coach, um, uh, had a lot of notoriety, just was a well-known guy. But I was a new I was a new kid at the school. And unfortunately, um, I mean, he was just very demeaning. Uh, would just cuss at the top of his lungs. And, and, and as, as a seventh grader, I think there was definitely times where whether I felt targeted or not, like I was targeted because I was the new kid. I don't know if it was kind of like, we got to break this kid in to see if he'll last. I don't know what it was. But looking back, it's sad because I told my parents, like after the first few practices, I said, I want to quit. I wanna, I, I, I'm done. I'm done with this. And baseball was my passion. So they're thinking, what in the world? And... Um, and they said, you know what, we're not going to let you quit. You're going to finish what you started. And I'm glad they did. And, and they instilled that lesson in me. But after my seventh grade year, I quit baseball. Not because I didn't love it. It's because I, I, I literally, through that experience, like I just started hating baseball. And here we are years later talking about this. <laughs> and it's like, who knows what I would have done in baseball or what would that would who knows what would have come of me sticking with it. But... I was way more passionate about baseball than I was football. And so I, I seem to think that, man, it could have looked a lot differently if I had a coach who, who said, look, I'm going to invest in you. I'm going to be positive in the way I coach. I'm going to be hard on you, but in the right way. And so I think that is sad to me. That is sad to me that we're, I'm giving you this example of an educator who took the other road and said, you know what, I am, I have a power trip or I'm going to demean other people. Now I've chosen to forgive him for the things he did and the ways that he acted and um, I, I personally moved on from that. I mean, this was in seventh grade, right? But I share this as an example because there's educators listening on this on this podcast that, you know, you they, they have the platform to either make a positive difference or a negative difference. And I think about, you know, something that I talk about often at speaking engagements is are you a, as an educator, are you a trust builder or are you a trust breaker? You know, and... Unfortunately, that person um, just, it, it, I quit. And yeah. looking back, I maybe should have been a little bit mentally stronger and tougher. And, you know, I probably should have. But as a seventh grader, I just didn't have that. And I, I, I gave it up. And so I just think it speaks to the stewardship responsibility, like the word stewardship. You know, it means to cultivate or to, to make something better or to grow it or to take responsibility of it. And I think educators, especially today, um, have such a responsibility of stewardship of saying, okay, these are the people that have been entrusted under my leadership. Now, what am I going to do to steward them well under my leadership? Thank you for sharing that. That's a, I mean, that's, that's a great example to show how it could. I mean, that, that it's a delicate relationship that, that happens and it does have an impact for the rest of your life. It sounds like you, you've, uh, come to good terms with that. I always think of like, um, hearing Tony Robbins speak like the motivational speaker, he, yeah, yeah. you know, like people who are, who are struggling to get over something from the past. It's you know, like taking that perspective of, of not only forgiving and then also saying like, thank you. Like, even though like that experience was bad, it helped create to who I am now and exactly. to, to be able to move forward from that. But it, it, it is amazing how probably everyone has stories like that. Mm. Mm. 100%. And I just think it's, uh, I just think it speaks to the impact that you can make going back to the Billy Graham quote. I mean, the, the amount of students, the amount of parents, the amount of people that you are able to impact as an educator is unbelievable. And 
on the flip side, I usually share a story and, and maybe some of your educators listening have seen this video on YouTube. It's amazing. I shared it at the end of my talk yesterday. And um, what it is, it's a, it's a, essentially the video is a second grade teacher who has this student in her second grade class and she writes a handwritten note at the end of the year and she says, hey, um, don't forget to invite me to your Harvard graduation wow. someday. Have you seen have you seen that? Video? I have not. No. Oh, you got to watch it. It's so good. It's on YouTube. But she she essentially says, "Don't forget to invite me to Harvard graduation." Well, sure enough, years later, she goes to Harvard. She goes to Harvard, and Harvard gets light of the story and, and the message. And so, um, they fly the teacher out to the graduation. They fly her out and pay for everything and do it. And it was just like, I mean, if you're an educator, you cannot watch that video without tearing up. <laughs> you got to have a tissue because. It just speaks to the fact, like that is what it's all about. And it's it's being intentional to speak truth and to encourage someone, because I think that's to your point earlier on leadership, that is leadership. You are you are believing in someone when maybe they don't even believe in themselves. Like that second grader, she probably didn't even know what Harvard was when she was in second grade, right? But this teacher saying, hey, invite me to your Harvard graduation. She saw that in her, she spoke that over here, her, and then now years later, look what happens. And so I think, um, with social media and all of the different accessibilities and all the things we have, man, like more than ever, people just human to human people need in this age of AI and all this fake stuff. It's like people just need that human connection and they need to be encouraged. And I think um, there's just such an opportunity in our schools today for that. And when you're around a coach or an educator who gets it and who lives that, kids flock to those teachers because they're like, I, that, like, they're craving it. They're, they're used to scrolling on TikTok all day on their phones when they're around a teacher who's investing in them and saying, hey, I'm here for you. What, what do you need? I'm going to meet you where you're at. It's like that is the those are the memorable teachers who really make a very positive impact on students. And, and it's one of those that, that we always talk about. They're playing the long game. I mean, to get that reward of, you know, a, a second grader and then getting that reward when they graduate from Harvard, that, that's a long investment in there. So see that return. Um, but the best educators view it that way. And I know there's a lot that's put on, on educators right now where it looks more at the short term. Mm -hmm. and, and there's definitely not enough talk or, or ways to, to bring that in. I mean, it, it's just uh, the, the nature of the game is that uh, the educators that, that really can make that investment and kind of like ignore uh, some of the things and have the bigger picture in there. Yeah. And th that to me is uh, is the name of the game and really where like leadership can really help reinforce mm -hmm. that if they could get some more of like those short term rewards, be like, hey, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing, even though like everything else that's thrown at them, uh, maybe telling them they should be focusing in other areas. Yeah, well, I do something when I go to schools where I have if I'm speaking to teachers, I'll say, hey, raise your hand if you've been teaching for one year. And I say, keep them raised, you know, five years, 10 years, 20. Yesterday, it got up to almost four, I think it was 32 years was the in the room. And it's like, that's first off, that's amazing to commit your life, your career to educating the next generation for 32 years. Like, psh, oh my goodness, that's amazing, right? And, um, but it's like, I, I tell them, I say, okay, you have someone that's been here for 32 years. And I say, raise your hand if it's your first year as a teacher. And, you know, a good amount of people raise their hand. So I'm like, anywhere on the spectrum, if it's your first year as an educator or it's your 32nd year, like, how do you want to look back on your time as an educator? Like, if you could look, like, to your point, if you could look forward and say, okay, I'm going to reverse engineer this, like, someday at my teacher retirement party, I'm assuming they do those these days still, teacher retirement party, there's cake, there's balloons, and what do you want people to say about you? Like, what do you want that room to look like? And I think if you're a teacher who... Uh, as John Gordon, my co-author, talks about all the time, love, serve, and care. As an educator, if you're intentional, he's the author of The Energy Bus. If you're intentional to love, serve, and care others, that room, that retirement room is going to look pretty good. It's going to be a lot of people there. It's probably going to be standing room only. <laughs> it's not. It's going to be tough to get a piece of cake because everyone's going to be, there's so many people there. But but the opposite is true as well. What what would it look like if you spend 20 years in education and, it's, and to you it's just a J-O-B and you don't invest in the kids and well that retirement party is gonna look a lot different <laughs> and i think um i think we can all think of educators in our lives mentors people who have demonstrated integrity to us and that's what our book is about is is leading with integrity 
and you know the root word of integrity is integer and, you know think about you know uh, in, in math which i told you before i don't like but <laughs> math you know a, is you know an integer it's a whole number it's a complete number and when you think about the fully integrated leader you know that person if you think back to any time in your life where someone has made the greatest impact in your life you know maybe it's a teacher it's a coach it's a parent it's a mentor when you think about that person and the positive impact they've had on your life most likely they have demonstrated high levels of integrity they have they not only walked the talk the talk they walked the walk like they were there for you when you needed them and so i think that's a big part of the message as, edu as educators is how do you bridge that gap how do you get over generational differences how do you meet them where they are at but um but you're there for them you're building trust with them you are uh, getting this relational equity with them so that when it's 10 o'clock at night and they need someone to call because they have things going on at home or they can have anyone to call they're texting or calling you and not that it's always super fun to get those calls but it's meaningful and to your point on the long-term game that's those are the long-term things that you look back on as an educator and say wow I was able to have an impact on that person's life or they were able to have an impact on my life and it's because I was intentional I asked the tough questions I was there for them I did those things and I just think honestly right now our culture um, sometimes I mean I just think we could use a lot more of those teachers a lot more of those educators and I think that's I mean people listening to your show are exactly that it's people pursuing that so that's why I love what you're doing man because um, ever since the pandemic right there's all these differences on is it homeschool is it private school is it all these different opinions right and I just think more than ever we need amazing educators I mean I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old and so I mean this is very I mean relevant to me in the sense that you know like where will I be entrusting my own kids in a few years you know and that's a relevant conversation that me and my wife and I have all the time and she she's a former first grade teacher and so um yeah, we're just kind of in the middle of even having those conversations ourselves. So, hey, if you have any advice for me, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, but, uh, yeah man, you're, you're, at the, you're at the fun stuff. age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you got the young ones where it's like, yeah, it, it's more yeah. about like energy of like, can we survive the day? And then as <laughs> they get older, it gets, yeah, it, it becomes a different difficult. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it moves into more, yeah, the, yeah, just variety. Our, our kids are 16, 12, and eight. And, um, yeah, and, you know, we've seen a lot of, a lot of that going through and just like the differences for each one of those kids, um, mm -hmm. they just need different things. And, uh, and to your point, it's like there, it, it can be a coach, it could be a teacher, it could, it, it can be com coming from a variety of different ways, but those, mm -hmm. uh, those other adults are just so needed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the teaching profession has always been one of those places to do it, but it does feel like recently, um, the view is like, don't go into education. Don't go, don't go there. And, and we do need to start changing, changing that perception. And, uh, and that's also on the school leaders of like, how do we make this more appealing? Mm -hmm. How do we block all the junk out to let teachers do? Because I don't think we're at a shortage of people wanting to help the next generation. I think yeah. we're at a shortage of people who want to deal with the junk that comes with education. Exactly. That, that's a great point because I, I, uh, I recently saw on my local news, they did a thing. They're trying to recruit more teachers for this year. And they have this policy uh, that they're instituting and it's called, um, it's like something, something along the lines of uh, hire on the spot policy because they're this certain school district uh, in Missouri that I saw, they are so desperate right now to find people that are willing, like you said, to become a full-time teacher. They are meeting these teachers at fairs, at state, you know, college or job fairs and saying, hey, your resume, there it is. Okay, well, guess what? We're going to offer you the job on the spot. <laughs> and it's just, I think, it's like to your point, it speaks to like there are the people out there, but is there so much red tape? Is there so much, you know, what are the things that um, need to happen to be changed so that those teachers can thrive? And, and, and you know, I think about my wife, you know, she, she now stays home with our kids, but so many of her friends who are teachers are no longer teachers and it's not just because they're stay-at-home moms they're doing other things and i just think how do you how do you retain the, those amazing talented teachers um that then go and do something else and so those are questions probably bigger than i can answer on the <laughs> show but those like you said those are for some of those school leaders and uh things like that but it is interesting to see like when you think about trends you know and i think about okay my one-year-old son 
in 17 years, when he's thinking about college, or however many years, whenever he'd start thinking about that, like what is that landscape going to look like? You know, it's very interesting post pandemic, what things look like. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Oh man, we, we can talk a lot about this. Um, <laughs> I, well, let's go there and then I, I'll, I'll pull in some other things because I, I do think this is an important conversation of somebody who, um, you know, isn't full-time invested or your, your career is not full-time dealing with schools and a lot of our audience is. So, so sometimes they like are in it too much. They can't really see like what's going on in kind of like the average household with parents, the conversations mm-hmm. that are happening at home being there. So maybe I'll just ask some questions. What, what are the first things that you're going to look at when you're trying to figure out what are the best schools? Because now we're in a world where there's choice. So yeah. I'm, I'm assuming, like, I don't know, Missouri, how, but, but there's some choice now, whether yeah. it's like full, like blown out charter schools or, or things like yeah. that. But what are the things that you're going to look at in a couple of years where you're like, all right, I got to figure out where to send um, my kindergarten? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I mean, these are the literal things we're processing right now, me and my wife, Erin. So, I mean, for us, I just think coming, you know, post pandemic, um, you know, here in Missouri, I I would say, um, yeah, like you said, there are a lot of different options. We literally, I mean, for one, we live in a uh, neighborhood where there's like a school, like within walking distance. So I will say that is a factor. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) That would be pretty pretty nice. But I I don't know, I just think, I just think it was so hard. We, we didn't have the kids who went through the pandemic in the schools. You know, they were you know, either not born or too young. And so we didn't have to navigate that like so many parents did. But um, yeah, I don't know, just thinking through, you know, making sure that they have access and they're able to be in person and do things like that, I just think is a big factor. I think, um, yeah, I don't know. That's really a tough question because we're, I mean, you kind of have, that's probably the best question you've asked all day. Cause you put me on the spot here because it's like where we are re- literally processing that right now. And my yeah. wife, as a former first grade teacher, she has a, a lot of amazing thoughts. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see where we land, but I think it's, it's, you know, I think college a little bit factors in because it's like, all right, if we did, if we did do private school, for example, did we do private school and then pay for college? Like there's all these different things you think about, right? Or it's like, okay, do you do public school and then try to pay for college? So I don't know. Like the, these are questions that like, maybe I need to ask you because you have kids oh, way older it, than, than ours. I, you've already I, have I think it's, out, I think it's interesting that college is even getting factored in at three and one. Right. Uh, but, but I think that's a great representation of, mm. of way parents are, are viewing things of and it really comes back to just like the much bigger picture of like what is the purpose of k-12 education like when Mm, you know when they're 18 what do you what do you really want exactly and that's a great that's a great point because if i think about you know i'm a millennial and you know my age group we saw all of our parents in 2008 go through you know the, the recession right and we saw that we saw how um it affected our like as a generation we saw our parents that happen And so, um, so now as we are thinking about like, you know, we went through college, it's like, okay, do I want my future kids to take out all of this student loan debt to then get a, like a minimum wage job out of college? Like that seems crazy to me. And so that's where my mind goes to, okay, as a self-employed person and I can provide for my family and do all these things. It's like, I technically didn't need college to do what I'm doing today. I mean, it was helpful and you meet people, but I didn't need it technically. And so it's like, what if my daughter wants to become a real estate agent? I mean, you could go get your license. And so like, I guess maybe I'm thinking too far ahead, but I think to your <laughs> point, it, it's like, okay, these trade schools, they're becoming so popular, homeschooling, all these different, like different options are like going crazy, right? Since the pandemic and it almost like accelerated that. So yeah, I don't know if I'm thinking about the right way. You tell me if I am, but I think it's just trying to think ahead of like, all right, will they be attending college and will college be how much will it be per year? You know, like what's that even going to look like? Or, you know, right now I speak at a lot of small colleges, a lot of these small colleges since the pandemic, they're going, they're going out a bit. I mean, they're, yeah, they're shutting they're their doors. Yeah. And so it's like, and from a sports perspective too, you talk about NIL or all these things. It's like, how do these small colleges, some of them, they're going through some tough times. And so, I mean, that's going to be interesting to play out. So yeah, I, I feel like we're starting to see the early signs on that. Like uh, I, I have a brother who works for one of the smaller colleges and they just like absorbed another college that was, that yeah. was close by because it is really hard for them to make it. 
right now. Um, it, 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 it's an interesting dynamic. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of like, of us being like, you know, like 10, 12, 15, you know, like years, yeah. a, a little further. It's, we didn't think about it. We grew, we grew up or where we, um, were at the time where our oldest was going to school. It was the same thing. We had a neighborhood school. There was, there was not even like any thought. It was like, this is where they go. Um, you know, good reputation, good school. And we didn't think anything about it. And then we moved to Arizona when our oldest was going into fourth grade and our middle one was going into kindergarten. And we're like, what in the world is going on out here? Like if we go to like the park in our neighborhood and you start asking where they go to school, there's like 12 different schools that you get answers from. It's like, wow. it's like total open enrollment. You can go anywhere. And there's a lot of good and bad to that. I, I've talked about that in the past uh, on the show of just the good and the bad of that. Um, but what it has forced us to do is start thinking about like, what do we really want for our, for our kids? And um, for me um, and, and my wife, like we answer is we, we want them to be, we're not trying to raise kids, we're trying to raise adults. Mm. Um, so so that, that's that been our perspective of like, um, we want them to be, we want them to be kind. We want them to be helpful. Um, we want them to enjoy life. Um, we want them to have joy, but we, the, the biggest thing is we, for us is like, we want them to have service towards others. Like if, if they are helping others, um, that's probably the best thing they can do for, for their personal health, um, as well as others around them. Um, and, and to me, it's, it, it truly started out as a joke. So I, I, I don't know if this formed some of my opinion was, but also being self-employed, I was always like, well, I'm not saving for college, so they're going to have to pay for college on their own. So I was, so I would always just, uh, answer that of like, yeah, like they're, they're not going to college. Like, <laughs> so it started as a joke, but then I feel like I've seen kind of this movement, this kind of change in, in approach from parents of starting to say like, is college really needed? I think there's a lot of factors, you know, around student debt and um, just around like kind of the pressures of of all kind of the institutional of like testing and, and everything, like just the sole focus on, on college that I feel like there is definitely some backlash to it. But it, it's, yeah. uh, it, it's a tough one as our oldest is getting to that point. Like, you know, do yeah. it. Do we encourage it? Do we discourage it? Do we just let him go his own path? It... Yeah, and I just can't even, yeah, that's crazy. So you guys are literally in the middle of navigating that. I can't even fathom in 15 years what it's going to look like. And, I, and I, it, it's just really interesting to think about what that will be from seeing what the trends will, will be like. And so, yeah, man, maybe we need to we schedule another podcast in about 10 years and yeah so then exactly. we can uh with each other uh, you'll still have this thing going i'm sure you'll have millions of listeners like you already do but uh we'll have to uh get that on the schedule because we'll be talking about crazy trends i'm sure then but yeah this is a interesting to talk about because so many people my age especially other entrepreneurs that i'm friends with they are just going they, they are just looking at very alternative routes yeah. and um yeah it's just it's just super interesting and so i think tying that all that in it's like when you like yesterday when i spoke to this group of teachers meeting some of them it's like when you're around teachers that care they get it they could be doing other jobs but they are in it for like the right reasons wow those teachers stand out they they stand out and and they're the type of teachers that the kids flock to the adults love and so i just think yeah. that's a cool way to think about it is if you're in education listening to this and you're going okay so much uncertainty it's like if you keep doing what you're doing, being excellent in what you've been given and encouraging the things that you just talked about, it's like that's at the end of the day, at the end of your career, at the end of your life, you're going to look back and say, wow, like I'm really glad that I did it this way. Yeah. I can't control all the other school stuff. I can't control whatever, but I can control me and, and, and the excellence that I bring every day. Um, um, yeah, my good friend Jimmy Casas, I know I don't know if you've had him on the show, but you know he talks about excellence and things like that. So I just think, man, in education – there's such an opportunity. And so, man, I, I, pre I appreciate you asking those questions though. Because yeah. Thanks. For, I mean, I mean, it's a yeah. great, I, I think it's really beneficial to the audience to start hearing like the, these are the things that parents are, are talking about because it, I, I know what they're, what they're faced with every day. Like I, I spent a yeah. lot of time with school leaders and it, you know, like it is stuff that um, unfortunately is not, not 
always focus on education. They have so many mm -hmm. other things they have to be thinking about. Um, and, and that's why I think we're seeing some of this, fra I call it the fragmentation of, of where it used to, used to be like for the most part public school, maybe a little bit of private school. Now we're seeing a whole bunch of different like micro schools and homeschooling and wow. charters and all, all these different like alternatives that are popping up and they really need to pay attention to it because I think it's going to yeah. happen really fast. I think so, and I think I think you need to write a book on that, man. Fred, I like how you use that terminology. Yeah. I don't know if you, do you already have a book on it. You might need to get working not, on not that. Not on that. I'm <laughs> trying to think of what, yeah, what the next book is, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, no, I think you're right, and I think I guess now that I've had a minute or two to think about it, I think one thing that we've talked about when you said like, you know, what are you guys considering? I just think um, something that we've noticed since the pandemic in some ways is that at some of these schools again i live in missouri so this maybe doesn't apply to everyone listening but because it has been at times hard for these schools to retain really good talent at times it can feel like um you know is this almost the the backup teacher that my that my my kid my child i'm going to give them to eight for eight hours a day and it's someone who maybe doesn't want to be there but they're just like doing a job and it's like, is that is that the best for my kid who I love and I want to see flourish? Or is it like my wife, who is a former first grade teacher who could invest in them or a private school? Like, I, we don't know yeah. th the answers there yet. And so we're still processing. But like, I think just to let you in on my mind of I'm not in education. I'm not even employed at a normal job. I'm, I'm, I'm self-employed <laughs> or whatever, like entrepreneur. So take take whatever I'm saying with a grain of salt for anyone listening. But these are the things that like me and other entrepreneurs friends are processing because we're like, man, what, what is this going to look like? So, uh, whether it's a co-op or a, who knows what? Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And yeah. And I don't, I mean, the, the interesting thing is nobody knows the answer right now because, because education is such that long game. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think it's interesting to watch everything that's going on and start looking at kind of the early signs and be like, what, what, what can we learn from each other? Right in there so yeah I, I didn't think our conversation was going to go that route um we did have your your co-author john gordon on the show how, how did you oh, guys cool. get connected yeah that's incredible was his episode pretty good yeah yeah we talked we i mean his positive of like positive oh, yeah he, energy he is, mentality I mean, to it yeah for any of the school leaders listening i mean if you have not had john come to your school and speak you need to he's, he's one of the best out there in the country you know when it comes to education and so um and leadership and so uh, we met, he spoke to, um, when I was on the team at Mizzou, as a senior, he spoke to the athletic department. And I connected with him afterwards and I told him, I said, I don't know what you just did, but I said, I want to do that when I'm a grown up, essentially, <laughs> when I grow up someday. Um, I said, I want to do that. And I said, is there any way I can learn from you? Can I be mentored by you? Whatever. And he said, well, are you willing to work for free? He was kind of like testing me. And I didn't really have a job. I was making much money. I didn't, you know, whatever. And I'm like, sure, right? And so I start, you know, managing his LinkedIn, doing some sales for him, doing different things. And I think really what it was is just I was trying to add value however I could. And because I'm like, you know what? I see what he's doing. I know I want to pursue that type of work when I, in air quotes, grow up someday. And um, so that was probably about eight years ago. And so um year after year i'd continue to do sales for him then you know his books like the energy bus or the power of positive leadership you know he can't speak at every event and so when he get an inquiry from a school district um to do an event he'd be like hey alex i can't speak at this one you go speak at it and so that's where i got my start in speaking as i would speak on his books and then in 2022 so um, we came out with the sale that we co-authored it's called the sale but it's not a book about um about sales it's a book it's a fable about leadership and leading with integrity and so that's why a lot of schools use it because it's just a great i don't know it's a good book study it's a good way to kick off the school year to talk about are you building trust are you um are you a person who is excellent in the way that you treat students are you are you a teacher that demonstrates integrity in the small things and so yeah it's been it's been a really fun ride with john just to you know speak on his books speak on the sale uh, message that we think is so important today in education and so that's how we got connected but ultimately i think you know people ask me a lot of hey what's your best advice for starting your own thing or going into business or whatever and i tell people all the time it's find someone who is a mentor someone who's ahead of you and try to learn do whatever you can to learn from them and that's invaluable and um 
and that's what I've done with John, and he's been super gracious. And so I think for anyone listening, if you're going, hey, I'm looking for a side hustle, I want to become a superintendent someday, whatever. What are you, what are you doing to take steps to be around the people who are doing the things that you want to do? And um, yeah, I think, and then just add value to those people. Don't you know? Because a guy like John Gordon or Jimmy Casas or Todd Whitaker, all these education people, it's like they get asked every day, like you, I'm sure, do for different requests or do. It's like, but if you can show them, hey, I'm going to add value to you and ask nothing in return, that stands out and it's memorable. And so, I think. Yeah, it's been it's been really fun to learn from him, um, and we have some other exciting things that we're talking about and working on. But yeah, it's uh, I just think his message of the energy bus. I'm sure a lot of your listeners have listened to it. It's so important because it's it's you know what does it look like to have a, a, a school culture and a classroom culture that encourages kids and allows them to just be people that grow up to like you said not to be kids, but they're you're raising adults and. Um, yeah, that's how we connected and still was texting right before this episode. And we're just, uh, just, I'm just really gracious to learn from him and uh, his wife, Catherine, she's awesome as well. And, and, the, and the whole John Gordon team as well. well. Kudos to you to, to take that on. I mean, it's really goes back just kind of like the old days of like apprenticeships of find somebody who's really good and spend some time with them and, and learn from them. And th- that kind of went away for a while. And, and, you know, like I get it, you know, like not everyone's in the situation where they can work for free or, or do that. But I do think like whether it's, you know, like a, a side thing, finding people that you respect and knowledge and, and view it and be like, you know what, my $15 an hour versus the knowledge. Um, again, you know, like I, I fully recognize not everyone's in the position to be able to do that, but it does feel like, um, Sometimes the younger generation is in, you know, it's hard to blame them when you can go get a job at 15 or $25 an hour when you're 18 or 20 years old. But sometimes that value of being able to to be around someone and, and really learn from them side by side um, should not, it, it, there's just so much value in that. And I think like we, we kind of lost a little bit of that. Like my generation had tons of unpaid internships. Like that's how we mm-hmm. learned those days are almost gone. Like they're yeah. like, even legally, it's really hard to even do like unpaid internships. <laughs> oh, it's so true. And it's honestly, it's, I think a generational thing too. millennials and Gen Z. It's like, um, we have so many good qualities and ways that we want to do work that we're passionate about. But at the same time, like, I'll be honest, there's just a lot of, in our generation, like there are just, there's just some people that are very entitled and they think, Hey, if I come out of college, I need to be making X salary. And it's like, but have you actually, added value have you to the organization you work for have you actually put in the work and so i mean a great example is um you mentioned you know the old days of, of being an apprentice it's it, it's it's true it, 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 you know think about today if you showed up and said you know what i want to be a plumber so i'm going to go job shadow a plumber for a week and if that plumber actually shows up on time does good work has integrity that plumber is going to make a lot of money <laughs> because people don't want to do that hard work and um you know, even thinking about John Gordon, he just published his like 31st book. And um, about two two years ago, I co-founded a company called Streamline Books. And so we help people write and publish their book. We just signed our 127th author, which is awesome. It's like we help people awesome. share their stories. Yeah, it's like educators, superintendents, all kinds of people, principals, coaches. We get to help them share their story. And it's like it would have never happened if I didn't have the mentorship of someone like John and seeing how he leveraged his books. And now it's like, man, I, I love writing my own books and speaking in schools, but I also love helping an educator who's saying, hey, I have a message to share. I don't have the time to write a book. I don't have the, the whatever, the, I, I'm busy, but like I have all the stories up here. And that's where like our team, they'll pair you with a writer, with an editor, with a project manager. And it's like, that gets me fired up. Cause it's like, that can help you make an, an impact on other people around you. And um, I think about, one of our superintendents recently, uh, his name's Anthony, Dr. Anthony Rice. He's a superintendent in California, great guy. He just published a book through uh, Streamline and it's just awesome. He's posting pictures on social media of him speaking about it and people buying the book. And it's just like, that's what it's all about. So I do think to your point, find the area of interest, find where you're trying to go, get around those people because that is the best way you learn. Yeah, very cool. Well, that, that's a, a good way to, to wrap things up here. Uh, we will have your information in, in the show notes here, too. 
Um, I mean, our, our theme, so our company K-12, um, where we work with schools and we, we do, we create better learning environments. So we're, we're working with the furniture side of things. Um, and then we also have another org- organization of education leaders organization, which is this confidential peer network for school leaders. Um, but we talk about the, just the power of storytelling mm-hmm. and, and trying to meet people where they're at, whether it is in books or through video or social media, being able to just really tell compelling stories. It's, uh, it, it, it it's you know like it, as much as we want to sit here and say like you know people make decisions like on logic stories are so powerful that emotional piece so i love hearing that of being able to get some of the stories out from school leaders and others that that have messages that, that just need to be out there yeah man that's awesome well i mean even kevin just for you just so you hear here on the podcast for any of your listeners um, if anyone reaches out to us from this show, we'll give them the Kevin discount. So we'll give them the Kevin discount. If they want to write, <laughs> publish their book, we'll make sure we hook them up. Um, Cause yeah, we just love working with educators and um, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Very cool. All right. So to the listeners, um, if you like conversations like this, just hit subscribe wherever you're listening to better learning podcast.com is our hub for everything on the podcast. Um, so show notes, everything are in there, but as well as there's a form, where you can put in suggestions for either topics, speakers, um, if, if you think you'd be a good uh, guest on the show. So we, we review that in our production meetings and try to figure out who, who are the best uh, ones to bring to our audience. So Alex, it was great talking to you. Great meeting you. Kevin, thanks for having me. Love, loved our time together and uh, man, keep making an impact. The views and opinions expressed on the Better Learning Podcast are those of myself as an individual and my guests and do not necessarily represent the organizations that we work for, the Association for Learning Environments, K-12, Education Leaders Organization, or Second Class Foundation.